Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our studies in the book of Judges. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this morning, for the time that we have to study your word together. And for the things that you have been teaching us that we believe are needful, not just for us, but for all those in this movement and all those interested in truth. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit uh, can lead those minds that are open to truth uh, to these studies. Or that they can come to understand these truths and receive a conviction in their personal lives through whatever means you see fit. Help us to be instruments of yours in revealing Christ's character. Help us to understand and apply the principles we have learned. And we ask now that your Holy Spirit can be here in this study to teach us, to lead us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask this. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning everyone again. Now, in the study that we had yesterday, and uh, Dwight, did you watch the video from yesterday? I get in kind of late last night, so no, I haven't seen it yet. Okay, because okay. I'm going to re review a little bit uh, from yesterday, uh, especially the first part of the study. So um, we were discussing, based upon the line that we had put together on Thursday, and, and that line was this line, um, where we took Jotham's line, what we call Jotham's line, and this is a, uh, a Joseph, Jotham's parable basically sets up this line. It's a review of the history, um, and we're taking it as the seven years from December 21st, 2012 to November 5th, 2019, November 15th, 2019. Uh, that's 25, 20 days. And um, each one of the seven waymarks represents uh, events that occur within those years, which we haven't specifically marked here in this diagram, though we have discussed it. And um, this represents the period of time in which uh, uh, that would parallel the history of the judges in where people are uh, seeking to... Uh, to do this work of taking taking over the work, uh, be, becoming made kings. So we have these people who are proposing to become kings, I guess, so to speak. Uh, but the judges, that is the, um, uh, the truths that are at this time are hindering that work. But when we get to November 15th, 2019, uh, the bramble is made king. Right. So that's going to be Abimelech's made king. And then he reigns for three years. And Abimelech's downfall really progresses through this entire history, this entire period. And we had discussed that, uh, that it's not at the end of the three years that, that the downfall begins. It begins right from the beginning. And um, now in, in addressing that, we. We try to understand how does this relate to the movement and our and our responsibility. And we know that there's the two towers, uh, the tower with the men of Shechem in it, and then the other tower, which is um, uh, I can't think of the name. It's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, it's going to be uh, where is this? A Thebes, Tebes, however you say that, probably Tebes. Um, so, so there's these two towers. One is burnt down, the other isn't. So there is a tower that, in a sense, survives. There's the, the movement survives. Um, but we can see that the movement, to some degree, is is weakened or falls apart. And, and so there's the implication here just that we, as we have with the church, that there's this progressive fall. And in some ways, Abimelech's downfall is sort of a downfall of a type of organization that has, to some degree, 
um, infected Adventism for a long time. And then I had made the suggestion that my understanding is that uh, true organization is being connected to Christ. And, and then yesterday I read some statements then that sort of seem counter to what I was saying, but actually describes how I understand this. So we're going to look at uh, these statements again from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is in Nine Testimonies. Um, and we're going to look at this again in the Friday night studies, but it'll be probably a few months before we do that. Um, because in the Friday night studies, we're going to read A.T. Jones' uh, uh, presentation that he made before the General Conference on May 27th, 1909. And this is a manuscript that was read before the delegates at the General Conference on May 30th, 1909, so three days after Jones had presented. So Ellen White here is actually addressing uh, the ideas and attitudes that Jones expresses in his appeal for evangelical Christianity. And I know this, I read this probably about originally would have been the early 90s. So maybe uh, it could have been as early as 1990 that I had read this and studied this. Uh, but I think it was about 91, 92 that I got uh, the pamphlet, appeal, An Appeal for Evangelical Christianity. And then I looked into it and I found this connection uh, with Ellen White's statement. And, and this statement here is often taken out of context. That is, people read it without recognizing the context of what A.T. Jones has been proposing. And so this, this statement sometimes is used to support uh, the church and the general conference in their decisions that we need to, you know, stay with the ship, all those types of ideas. Um, but she's actually describing something quite different than what people uh, who are supporting the church are calling for, but also uh, undermines this sort of independent um, I'm just going to follow God and do what I believe to be right idea that we often see on, on the opposite side of that issue. And so this is a much more, for lack of a better word, balanced or at least nuanced um, understanding of what true organization is and what our responsibilities are to our brethren in regard to uh, doing the work. And this is the issue that we presently are struggling with in this movement. And I've struggled with my whole life as an Adventist. Um, you know, so since I became an Adventist in 1982, um, because I'm a very independent thinker, uh, very uh, much, I, I prefer not to work with others. That's always been a criticism that teachers have had uh, regarding me. Um, I don't, I don't like to cooperate with other people. I'd rather just do things on my own. And so for me as a Christian, I recognize the need to work with others, even when I differ with them. And um, so that's something I've always sought to do, even though it's not something that's natural to me. Um, and, and I think it's, it's important to recognize if we have that characteristic of an independent spirit, um, that there is, there is a place for this idea of being self-motivated and, and being able to accomplish things on your own, but also uh, the, uh, the wisdom in uh, having other people sort of check your work and, um, and also the benefit that they can receive when you cooperate with them. So you can be a blessing to others, much more if you're cooperating with others than if you're just doing things on your own. But we're going to read this again. So we had read part of this, but we're going to read the whole thing. <clears throat> so Ellen White says, before leaving uh, Australia and since coming to this country, I've been instructed that there is a great work to be done in America. And those who were in the work at the beginning are passing away, only a few of the pioneers of the cause now remain among us. 
and many of the heavy burdens formerly borne by men of long experience are now falling upon younger men. This transfer of responsibilities to laborers whose experience is more or less limited is attended with some dangers against which we need to guard. The world is filled with strife for the supremacy, the spirit of pulling away from fellow laborers, the spirit of disorganization is in the very air we breathe. And I believe this is a direct reference to Jones' ideas that are being presented uh, you know, three days before. By some, all efforts to establish order are regarded as dangerous, as a restriction of personal liberty, and hence to be feared as popery. These deceived souls regard it a virtue to boast of their freedom to think and act independently. They declare that they will not take any man's say so, that they are amenable to no man. I've been instructed that it is Satan's special effort to lead men to feel that God is pleased to have them choose their own course independent of the counsel of their brethren. And if anybody wants to comment at any time, feel free to do so as we read through this. Herein lies a grave danger to the prosperity of our work. We must move discreetly, sensibly, and in harmony with the judgment of God-fearing counselors. For in this course alone lies our safety and strength. Otherwise, God cannot work with us and by us and for us. Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly, that there be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise, careful labor. License must not be given to disorderly elements that desire to control the work at this time. So, I mean, when we look at this, this idea, we can see that uh, a person could take this paragraph here particularly and say that, you know, we need to work with an organization and, and we could even we could take this paragraph and say, well, what we read, need right now is an organization. But she's talking here about uh, organization, not as an institution per se, though that can be part of it, um, but a system of organization. So what? What would be the difference between an organization as an institution and a system of organization? Do we see the difference? One being a, a type of a structure. Mm -hmm. And then one being almost more as a, um, I'm searching for the right word, um, a method. Okay. So, um, well, any type of organization has structure, but the question is, um, how is that authority exercised? Is it, is it, I mean, do we need a legally recognized organization or institution? Um, so I would, I would look at it as institutionalism against organization. Organization can occur without an institution. People can work together, even if there's not an institution, uh, sort of forcing them to work together, if you know what I mean. Right. So there is order. You know, gospel order doesn't imply that you have to have uh, an institution or, or government supported institution to force um, or coerce people to act in certain ways. That and, and the way that I look at a church is a church is a voluntary organization. Um, and I've tried to explain this to some pastors where they, they believe that somehow if, if a church board makes a decision, everybody should just follow it. 
Um, but the responsibility also exists with the leadership to know how to create cooperation with the members. That is, people don't have to support something that this, a decision that a church board makes or a pastor makes or leaders make. Um, and so if you're going to have true organization, there has to be true leadership and true leadership can help motivate people um, through, through proper methods, not uh, force, uh, but to, to buy into, let's say, um, the ideas or the, the goals of a church, right? So organization is much more organic than just an institution. An institution can sort of be a, an artificial way of controlling um, properties and funds and people. Um, but true organization sort of is the, the breath of an organization, right? The breath of an institution, an institution that is not um, filled with the spirit of organization will actually crumble, right? I don't know if that explains it well or not. But you can have a society that has all of the institutional um, machinery in place, but that doesn't mean that that, that, that country can survive if, if the system is corrupt, right? If people don't buy into uh, the institutions, if they don't support them, um, the institutions can't survive. So, uh, you know, we'll kind of look at this a little bit more of how I understand organization. So she says, some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I've been instructed by the Lord that in this work, there is no such thing as every man's being independent. The stars of heaven are all under law, each influencing the other to do the will of God, yielding their common obedience to the law that controls their action. And in order that the Lord's work may advance healthfully and solidly, his people must draw together. So I've always had the view that as we be near the close of time, that Christ will be our leader, that the institutions that once organized the work will no longer exist. But that doesn't mean that organization does not exist. So when she's talking about acting independently of, of a, any religious organization, a religious organization can exist without an institution of that organization. And so in order for us to be organized, we have to be connected with Christ, but if we're connected with Christ, we will draw together to work with our brethren. So in no way am I ever suggesting that we're just all going to act independently and somehow this brings about order. We need to be connected to Christ in order to draw together and work. Um, so I'm, I'm not in favor of this idea that, well, I'm just going to do what I believe to be right, and somehow that will work out. Uh, we still need to work with others. The spasmodic, fitful movements of some who claim to be Christians are well represented by the work of strong but untrained horses. When one pulls forward, another pulls back. And at the voice of their master, one plunges ahead and the other stands immovable. If men will not move in concert in the great and grand work for this time, there will be confusion. It is not a good sign when men refuse to unite with their brethren and prefer to act alone. Let laborers take into their confidence the brethren who are free to point out every departure from right principles. If men wear the yoke of Christ, they cannot pull apart. They will draw with Christ. So you can see that to wear the yoke of Christ 
does not mean that we just go about and do our own thing. That we actually have to uh, draw with Christ. That means working in harmony with our brethren. Some workers pull with all the power that God has given them, but they have not learned that they should not pull alone. Instead of isolating themselves, let them draw in harmony with their fellow laborers. Unless they do this, their activity will work at the wrong time and in the wrong way. They will often work counter to that which God would have done, and thus their work is worse than wasted. And, and this is the problem we have in this movement, is that there is no seeking, or very little of it, of seeking to be in harmony with those that we differ. And, and that's what I understand. It's easy to be in harmony with those that have the same ideas as you, that think like you. Um, but we need to be, seek to be in harmony with others who may see things differently. And this is a difficult uh, thing to do. Now, Ellen White gives some balance here, some counter arguments here. Um, on the other hand, the leaders among God's people are to guard against the danger of condemning the methods of individual workers who are led by the Lord to do a special work that but few are fitted to do. Let brethren in responsibility be slow to criticize movements that are not in perfect harmony with their methods of labor. Let them never suppose that every plan should reflect their own personality. Let them not fear to trust another's methods. For by withholding their confidence from a brother laborer who, with humility and consecrated zeal, is doing a special work in God's appointed way, they are retarding the advancement of the Lord's cause. God can and will use those who have not had a thorough education in the schools of men. A doubt of his power to do this is manifest unbelief. It is limiting the omnipotent power of the one with whom nothing is impossible. Oh, for less of this uncalled for, distrustful caution. It leaves so many forces of the church unused. It closes up the way so that the Holy Spirit cannot use men. It keeps in idleness those who are willing and anxious to labor in Christ's lines. It discourages from entering the work many who would become efficient laborers together with God if they were given a fair chance. To the prophet, the wheel within we, the, a wheel, the appearance of the living connect, creatures connected with them all seemed intricate and unexplainable. But the hand of infinite wisdom is seen among the wheels and perfect order is the result of its work. Every wheel directed by the hand of God works in perfect harmony with every other wheel. I've been shown that human instrumentalities are liable to seek after too much power and try to control the work themselves. They leave the Lord God, the mighty worker, too much out of their methods and plans and do not trust to him everything in regard to the advancement of the work. No one should for a moment fancy that he is able to manage those things that belong to the great I am. God, in his providence, is preparing a way so that the work may be done by human agents. Then let every man stand at his post of duty to act his part for this time and know that God is his instructor. So when we talk about this type of organization that she's presenting, where is the biggest onus of responsibility of organization laid upon? Like where is the, who, who is responsible primarily? for organization. God. Okay, well, God is, but as far as next to God. So, so when we have organization, we look at leadership, right? So we, we have leadership and we have the membership. But we see that the leadership can't force organization upon the membership because that's what leadership often tries to do. So each individual has his part to play. The main 
role of the leadership is to facilitate communication and cooperation amongst the membership. That's the role of a leader. It is not so much to command as to lead by example and to spend time um, because what an institution or an organization can do is help uh, communication to the different parts of the body. So it's, it's important that the individual seek to unite himself with his brethren. If this is not done, organization cannot occur. Do you agree with me on that point? Yes. And that all of the differences that we have, um, these can be good leadership can actually help utilize the different types of individuals that exist. Because we, we seek to work with our brethren, but what leadership can do is help help that work, help direct things so that, you know, one thing that an organization can do is you don't, uh, and needlessly, um, you know, like if everybody was going to have a, you know, back in the old days when we had DVDs, right? You know, a DVD copier when, you know, you could have people work together and one person have a copier and, and you know, he can copy DVDs. But if you have one, one person trying to do everything, you know, I know this from running a guitar store. I mean, you need different people to do different tasks. And that's what organization can do. It can help direct people to do things. But it doesn't have to be a, a, a true leader doesn't um, micromanage everything that a person is doing. He recognizes different talents and abilities, and he helps direct that person and support that person in doing those things. That's what that's what the church is for. That's why we're organized as a church. And um, so to me, when I look at, uh, you know, once, once the int institutions disappear, we're not going to be individual atoms just operating on our own going about, you know, doing uh, what we think best. We're going to be working together with other people. And this movement, from my perspective, has not learned to do this. That if other people don't think like us, then we basically shun them. And... Um, you know, on, on Sabbath, and I talked about this yesterday too. So on Sabbath, we had Maimon Wilson presenting. And and I actually thought it was quite a good presentation. Um, I, I wouldn't have done that on Sabbath myself personally. Uh, you know, some of the things I just wouldn't have done for a, a Sabbath presentation because I would look at a Sabbath presentation as being definitely much more spiritual these are very practical things he presented about um <clears throat> uh, uh, you know the human anatomy and things that we can do to take care of it and uh and so that was good information nothing nothing particularly wrong and but you know my point is to just because i wouldn't do something a certain way um it doesn't mean i i have to you know, fight against it or not support it. But also there should be in working together, we should be able to listen to one another about concerns. So if I was doing something and somebody said, well, you know, I don't think that that's the best thing to present on Sabbath, then I should take into consideration what that person says, right? That is, I should seek to be in harmony with my brethren. Because if we do so, if we can learn to cooperate together, um, then we can be a powerful witness. And this has to happen if this movement is going to be at all effective. Right. Now, you know, so we've been struggling with this ever since, you know, FFA disappeared. We, we've been without an organization. 
And remember, this movement is typifying what's going to happen on a larger scale, right? That we can see that what has happened in this movement is going to happen to Adventism. That is, Adventists will, will exist without an institution. The institution either will have completely departed from the truth, supporting the Sunday and so forth, or the institutions will be dissolved because they're not supporting the Sunday. Either way, whatever scenario a person uh, would put forward regard how the church is going to uh, respond to the Sunday law, we could see that the church as an institution will not survive right? as God's church. Either it's not God's church supporting the Sunday or it's just not existing. Uh, the schools, the hospitals, all those things will be gone. And when, when those things, when those institutions um, cease to exist, many Adventists who basically feed off of those institutions, that is, that's, they're just Adventists because of the jobs they have and the social support they have, when that disappears, many people will go out from us and then many people will join Right. So we know that Ellen White is not saying here that the church is just going to always exist at the end of time. What she's saying is that we're not going to be acting independently of our brethren. So the relationships that we have with other Adventists, I believe, in some ways will be strengthened once we move forward into uh, that time. Now, of course, we don't see that happening so much in this movement, which means that this has to happen in this movement, if this movement's going to accomplish what it's been set up to do. Now, um, this next section on the General Conference I want to go through as well, uh, because this is one that's often misused on, on both sides of the issue. She says, I have often been instructed by the Lord that no man's judgment should be surrendered to the judgment of any other man. Never should the mind of one man or the minds of a few men be regarded as sufficient in wisdom and power to control the work and to say what plan shall be followed. But when, in a general conference, the judgment of the brethren assembled from all parts of the field is exercised, Private independence and private judgment must not be stubbornly maintained, but surrendered. Never should a laborer regard as a virtue the persistent maintenance of his position of independence, contrary to the decision of the general body. At times, when a small group of men entrusted with the general management of the work have, in the name of the general conference, sought to carry out unwise plans and to restrict God's work, I have said that I could no longer regard the voice of the general conference represented by these few men as the voice of God. But this is not saying that the decisions of a general conference composed of an assembly of duly appointed representative men from all parts of the field should not be respected. God has ordained that the representatives of his church from all parts of the earth, when assembled in a general conference, shall have authority. The error that some are in danger of committing is giving to the mind and judgment of one man or of a small group of men the full measure of authority and influence that God has vested in his church in the judgment and voice of the general conference assembled to plan for the prosperity and advancement of the work. So one of the things we can see here, what is the role of the general conference according to this statement? represent the opinions and views of all men. Okay, it's assemb everywhere. assembled to plan for the prosperity and advancement of his work. Oh, I said it's so, so the General Conference is not a doctrinal authority, correct? Agreed. And that, so she's not talking here about doctrine. She's talking about the work that needs to be done. And, and often uh, 
what has happened is the church has been set up as a doctrinal authority. That is the general conference. And of course we've set up, um, you know, a statement of beliefs that then can be enforced in, you know, um, controlling workers and so forth. Um, but here, when we look at the general conference, when she's talking about the authority, this is an authority of, of, of the plan for planning the prosperity and advancement of his work, right? This is working in the field, right? Um, so often people take this statement differently than it's meant to be taken. Um, she says, when this power which God has placed in the church is accredited wholly to one man, and he is invested with the authority to be judged for other judgment for other minds, then the Bible order is changed. Satan's efforts upon such a man's mind would be most subtle and sometimes well nigh overpowering. For the enemy would hope that through his mind he could affect many others. Let us give to the highest, let us give to the highest organized authority in the church that which we are prone to give to one man or to a small group of men. So this highest organized authority is the entire church body, right? This duly appointed general conference idea. But we can see that this is not how the church is presently operating. Would you agree with me that the church, that the general conference has been acting outside of its God-given authority? Yes, agreed. Okay. And, and we can even see this in the, the 28th fundamental belief and how it was pushed through a general conference, if anybody knows of the history of how that happened. Um, and that is because we have institutions that are not interested in following the councils in the spirit of prophecy. And this becomes a problem for Seventh-day Adventists because we believe in this church that God has given us, right? The truths that God has given us, you know, in a general sense. And yet the church has departed from that. And so for many Adventists, this is a problem. And some just follow the church wherever it leads. Now, if we apply this then on this large level of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I mean, we can see how uh, the December 6, 2020 declaration was against the spirit of this council that was given here. Right. So this movement basically had um, an example of what's going to happen in the future, that we will be shut out. But that will end in the dissolution of the church, because once you have those who are connected with Christ shut out of the church, that church can no longer survive. It's actually it's 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 will to survive, even as an institution uh, falls apart. And we saw that with FFA. Once they shut out those who were willing to follow the truth, they, they actually saw no need for their institution to exist. And I believe this will happen with the church itself, that the Adventist church will dismantle. But we're, we're in a history in which we now parallel to some degree what's going to happen. And the question is, how are we going to act? Because this is what we've been struggling with. So if we get back to our study in Judges, um, we had reviewed yesterday um, the fall of Abimelech. Um, the two different towers, Tebez and uh, the tower with the men of Shechem, the tower of Shechem. And and then we also looked at um, uh, 
Miller's rules, this millstone cast upon Abimelech's head, um, and then the sword that is going to slay Abimelech, that a young man who is the armor bearer is going to slay him. So this is the word of God. So we have Miller's rules and the word of God that slays Abimelech. And Abimelech is a spirit that exists within this movement. Right. And uh, what happens is the prophecy of Jotham uh, is fulfilled. And the prophecy of Jotham relates to the 70th week. And the 70th week points to April 5th, 2030 as a date, whatever that means. So the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam, came upon uh, all of, upon the heads uh, of the men of Shechem, upon Abimelech, because of what had happened in the slaying of the 70 brethren. So when we go back to this diagram, We haven't laid out Abimelech's downfall uh, clearly. Now, I'm saying that his downfall progresses. When you get to the end, that's going to be the death of Abimelech, the seventh way mark. And we're saying that's December 25th, 2021. At least that's what we're saying here in drawing the di diagram in this way. And that 777 days, of course, is going to start on November 9th. It overlaps with the first part that ends on November 15th. So uh, we would put November 9th, 2019 as the first way mark and the last way mark as December 25th, 2021. <coughs> so what is this saying to, the, to us in the movement at this time? What is it that we should be recognizing through this uh, story of Jotham and the Bimelech. Because Jotham for forces us to look at the past. And the downfall it, of the Bimelech makes us look at the future. Okay. So isn't, this also, isn't this also addressing our responsibility? within this in the movement, our responsibility to continue to, to study, to understand so that we can present a clear message. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, well, definitely. I mean, that's the one thing that we've always known that we have to continue to study and because we have to give a message, a message within this movement and a message to the church. But, you know, I mean, maybe I just struggle with these things, you know, because of my personality, wanting to do things right. I mean, I don't, I don't want to hinder the work in any way. So the way that I've approached this, as I've said many times, is I seek to work in harmony with others even when I see differently, you know, and a, a good example would be July 18, 2020. Um, I knew that the prediction could fail, but I wasn't going to present a message contrary to what Jeff was saying. I would hint at it, you know, because I could say all the evidence points to July 18, 2020 is this event occurring, but it may not occur because we have a line telling us that it might not occur part of a, a line of, of failed predictions but yet you're going to support warning Nashville because that's what it's pointing to and you have to then accept the consequences when it doesn't occur it would have been easy just to say I don't think it's going to happen in spite of the fact that it's pointing to this event because it's on a line of failed predictions. And I could have been opposing Jeff and saying we shouldn't be pro proclaiming, you know, the destruction of Nashville based on what we have. But I left it in Jeff's hands because I believe that that's how we are to operate. 
that we need to work in accordance with our brethren. Now, it's difficult when you get to some degree shut out. In some, some degree, I, I was shut out of first FFA and then uh, the American group, and by implication, then the Canadian group, um, of definitely presenting, um, but even to make statements during studies, didn't feel I didn't feel comfortable doing that. And I didn't feel that I could sit through the studies uh, when there were so many things that I found, um, for lack of a better word, offensive. That is, things that I believe, statements that were being made, and, and I find, you know, conspiracy theories counterproductive to the work. I mean, I don't believe that they're helpful uh, to this movement or to the Lord's work in general. I agree with what Jeff said in Oklahoma in 2010 and, and what Ellen White has said about speculative theories. We know conspiracies exist, but these are not our message. And they're not to be our main study. We need to be studying God's word and the truth, not all the things that we imagine that the enemy might be doing, especially secret things that we don't have, we're not privy to, right? So, <clears throat> so anyway, we're, we're seeking to work together with our brethren. We're proposing that we have this camp meeting this summer, which we're going to go ahead with, right? So we're planning a camp meeting, unless the Lord stops it for some reason, uh, we're planning a camp meeting and we can't make people go there, right? We can only offer an invitation and we don't know whether that camp meeting is, is the means by which God is going to help bring this movement together or some other means. We don't know, but we need to seek in, to act in harmony. That's why in even setting the time for the camp meeting, I, you know, asked, what is a good time, right? I didn't just set a time and expect people to come. Well, you know, there's still not a lot of discussion. We had one little discussion about it. And so we have a time. And of course, there's never a time that's convenient for everyone. So, so we have to set some kind of time and we have to do it well enough in advance that people can make plans. But we still have to seek to be in harmony with our brethren. Right. And and how this happens, and this doesn't just include people in this movement. This also does include um, Seventh Day Adventists, people that we know. That is, we need to be presenting ourselves in the way that God wants us to present ourselves. That is to be um, teachable and open and cooperative and not self-justifying, not aggressive. <clears throat> you know, this independent spirit, I've, I've seen it many times, and, and, and it's pretty natural to occur in a movement like we're a part of, because people, the reason why they, they gravitate towards these types of movements, there's two types of people. There's the followers, and there's the people who have a personal agenda. They're the critical people. Generally, uh, they create a spirit of criticism. It's a type of self-justification. Uh, they act independently. Uh, they're quite boasting and mocking of others. We saw a lot of this in this movement. Um, it's not Christ-like. And they will believe that any time that they are slighted, that... Um, it's an injustice, what they think of as being slighted. We have saw people like that in this movement. Uh, we saw one who, uh, um, you know, Jeff ended up kicking out of the School of the Prophets um, back in 2019. And, and I was, you know, somewhat sympathetic with him because I'd been kicked up myself. So I understand what that was like. But his, his attitude about it, his bitterness about it, uh, was not anything that was appropriate because sometimes we're treated unjustly, but sometimes we're treated what we perceive as unjustly for very just reasons. And so we have to be really careful. How do we act when we're mistreated or we perceive to be mistreated? 
are we understandable and why people act the way that they do or why they perceive things the way they do? And so these, these are very difficult questions that um, we need to answer. And, and we need to answer for ourselves because if we're going to believe that somehow uh, we have the truth and, and other people should listen to us, uh, we're going to need to act in a way that makes that tr truth attractive. That is, we really need to be following Christ, not just talking about it. So <clears throat> if we're going to take Abimelech's downfall and place events, so like we had done with these other lines where we had had taken, you know, the story of Jael Baal with the 777 and Gideon with the 777. Uh, we put those dates. We had events in this line. Uh, can we then take this line or even just uh, Abimelech's downfall line here? We have them just separated. Um, and we say that what's being tested here is uh, Jeff's, FFA, and then the FFA afterwards, right? So that's how we had, had uh, drawn that up, right? like this, remnant of FFA. Um, how would we place these way marks, and what would we use from the story of Abimelech to do so? So, for instance, if we're going to take Abimelech, and we're going to... Um, Let's do this here. So let's see if we can actually do this and it makes sense. <clears throat> so we're saying that Abimelech's reign begins November 9th, 2019, right? Abimelech is now made king. So this is a message that predominates in the music and he's going to reign for three years this is the period of time of the 777 days now um when we take this when when god sent an evil spirit between abimelech and the men of shechem and the men of shechem dealt treacherously with abimelech so this would not be the beginning of this we know that his beginning is when he's made king and when he's made king, there's this parable given. And this parable is, um, the parable of Jotham is the 70th week, but specifically, it's going to be the 70th week in relationship to um, to what? What is it that's presented on November 9th, 2019? And how does this relate to uh, this parable. So I present the 273. What is the 273? So I'm at, I'm at the School of the Prophets, November 9th, 2019. I present for the Sabbath School Superintendent uh, remarks. I present the 273, and then I present it in the afternoon. What is that? In one way, March 27th, and another way, it's the um, the portion of those that were saved when the ship wrecked that we, we find at, at the end of the book of Acts. Okay. It's good you brought that up because... Um, and, and Stephen would remember that if he was here. But what Jeff did on, um, on the 8th of November is he sent us a, a PDF. And uh, we actually looked at that PDF in some of our studies when we studied Acts. But this was a document that was, um, well, it was written in a very bombastic style. Uh, it was it was very very flowery um, written as if it was written by you know an apostle or something but it, it was just it was a little bit over the top dramatic um, and it was um, I can't remember the guy's name I could probably find 
the document if I knew exactly where to look on my computer. Um, I could find it in my emails, I guess, again. Um, but uh, it was addressing uh, Acts chapter 27. That's what the document was about and its relationship to November 9th, 2019. So we looked at it when we studied Acts 27. We did an extensive study on that. Um, but I see that as partly connected to what I presented the next morning. So I think it was, it was either Friday morning that we read it, but it might have been Sabbath morning that I read the document. I can't remember. I'll have to look at in my emails. Um, but I think that is relevant to understand that this is about the message to the Levites and that on the eve of November 9th, 2019, we were, begin we were given a message, even though the message was, I, I don't think that the message was wrong. The guy just, whoever wrote it, um, chose to write it in this sort of style, which I wouldn't have because that would be, almost guarantee that nobody's going to want to read it and would think you're a nutcase. So I wouldn't have written in that style, but he chose to. Um, but I think he made lots of valid points. I don't know what happened to him after November 9th. But this message of the 273, I connected it to the Mayan calendar. Right? So this was about... Uh, these two periods of 273 days uh, that were uh, created by looking at the Mayan calendar. This is a work that I had figured out, um, a study that I had done in October 10th. Um, and uh, that study pointed to October 11th, 2019. And, and it's 273 days from there to uh, July uh, July 10th, which is the 10th day of the seventh month, and then another 273 days uh, that were uh, also created by this Mayan calendar structure. So the Mayan calendar became connected with this 273. We had uh, this other message regarding Acts 27, which relates to the 273. And, and you're, Dwight, you're talking here, you're bringing up this this 273, the significance here is you have the 273 in this 276 that survive, and then the three that represent, what do the three represent? What does Paul, Luke, and um, Aristarchus, what do they, I think it's Aristarchus. When they represent leadership. Okay, um, I don't know if leadership is quite the way that I would put it. So, I mean, we have them representing basically um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to some degree. But isn't that the leadership, the leadership that we should be? Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I thought you were talking to like about the bad leadership. Not at all. <laughs> okay, so, so the leadership of God's people, right? Yes. True leadership, not not the institution, not FFA or anything like that. Agreed. Okay. Yeah. So so it would be uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Their work. It also represents the three angels' messages. Um, which are given to the two seventy three, right? To the Levites. And and this journey of Paul. Right. Sailing for Rome, we can see that this represents the progress of this message uh, up to and including July 18, 2020, right? So that's how we understood this. But then we have this shipwreck at the end. Now, the shipwreck, of course, is um, the boat, right? The ship, right? What do we Adventists always say? We need to stay with the ship, right? Yeah, we can see that there is a shipwreck, and that ship represents the church, right? The organization was Belshazzar a shipwreck? Daniel five. 
Um, well, I, I don't know. Uh, what do you mean it, it shipwreck? There's no ship there. I'm a literalist, so. I know you're a literalist. I'm speaking figuratively. I don't know. I mean, because how would you compare what happens there with the shipwreck other than a fall of a kingdom? Um, more if I put a shipwreck there, because this is more about a church. Didn't I mean Nebuchadnezzar himself had a had a time period where he was no longer in control, right? Yeah, that's that's Daniel four. So he was unable to steer the ship of state of Babylon, right? Yeah. And then what of Belshazzar? Well, his kingdom falls. So, Correct. you know, so that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's the end of him. Right. But what the end of him is also the end of Babylon. Yeah. But I don't look at Babylon particularly in that context as a ship, but um, I'd have to think about it more. Okay. So what's 1 Timothy 1, verse 18 to 19, Angela? Well, focusing on the word shipwreck, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might swore a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. I know I tuned in late, but I had a dream. It was very brief. And I, I had a dream. I was sitting in the church building at the back. There was Satan in the front, a person whom I now recognize as Satan, directing the congregation to change the sign outside the church from Seventh-day Sun, uh, Seventh day Adventist to Sunday keeping Adventist because the church was no longer keeping the Lord's Sabbath, it would be keeping Sunday. I woke up in a flash and I thought, this is a precognitive dream. Like this is illustrating what's happening. Yeah, so making shipwreck of the faith, I think is an important, because that's what I look at as just ship a shipwreck as. That is, um, it's not so much uh, the institution that's, that's falling, but the church that's falling now in oh, um, and we see that with with this movement that if, if we look at what november 9th was about and because it's the start of this line um we we then can say um i don't know how we can say it but what we what we can say is that uh, this this movement was heading for shipwreck because we were on this ship because this is a message right the message of the three angels messages it's representative of the father son and the holy spirit leading and there's the prophecy of paul that god gave him that everybody would survive the ship Right, so these are those that um, go through this shipwreck, but yet this 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 is needful for giving a message. And so I'm not I don't know how to express it very well, but if we look at um, so this message of Abimelech, because I was I was reading quite a bit about it. So one of the thing is Abimelech is the only judge, if you want to call him a judge, he is a judge, right? Self-appointed judge and a king um, who actually is not an external or an, an enemy. It's an internal enemy, right? And we know that this message of Abimelech, the way that we've we've set this up, is that uh, I'm going to go here. 
So the way that we we've understood Abimelech, there it is. <clears throat> we have Jotham's line. We we didn't put Abimelech here as one of the judges. We just put Jotham here. Um, so, so I don't include Abimelech as a judge because he's not opposing some enemy. In a sense, he's a judge that is an enemy. Right? Correct. Yeah. And now he has come after the empowerment of the first angel's message. And we... We know when we have our lines that the work of the enemies occurs in that history, specifically after the empowerment of a message. Right? That's how Jeff has always drawn this line. You have the foundation being laid, and then the message is empowered, and then you have the work of the enemies. So if we're going to put Abimelech in this line, He's, he's not going to be one of the judges, even though technically, you know, he, people recognize him as a judge. But he's he's a king. And he's opposed to God's people. Right. He's opposed to the truth. So he's definitely not a good character. Right. He's not somebody who's standing for God. He's somebody who's really opposed to um, the work that God is doing. He's. He's an antichrist figure in a sense, if you want to put it that way. He's a, an opposed to Christ. So he's not a true judge. So he's not on our line in that sense. But Jotham exists in that period of time, right? And, and he symbolizes Samuel Snow's message. And so Jotham's line, you can see, is really what this movement is about. That is, this movement has been proclaiming the prediction before midnight, the message of Samuel Snow. And it's in counteraction to a false message, which has been developing and growing, that is based upon a conspiracy. That's going to be Parminder's message, but not just Parminder. It's going to include all of these people who um, had sought to um, oppose Jeff and this movement within the movement, right? Because Abimelech is doing that. And so we had that with the group that in 2014 uh, that Jamal led out in, that wrote the letter against Jeff. We're going to see this progress um, even though we have uh, those groups leave, we're still going to have Parminder's movement and Mark Bruce's movement um, and other people as well, individuals who are seeking to oppose the truth. Even in 2015, there was lots of opposition um, at the camp meeting in the fall to uh, my understanding of the 2520 that Jeff accepted. But there, the group from Alabama was opposing it, wanting Jeff to deal with me. Uh, we saw this again in 2016 uh, with Tabo. Um, we saw this in 2017 with Parminder opposing what I was doing, though much more indirectly. Uh, we saw this in 2018 with Tess uh, opposing my validation of November 9th. And then we saw this also with FFA in how they, they were treating me and then in 2019 as well. So, so all through this history, we have a message and it's not about me personally, it's about what I'm presenting. So they're opposed to what I'm presenting. So instead of addressing what's being presented, all along the way, what people do is they attack the man, right? So they're not going to openly discuss the things that they don't agree with they're just going to attack the messenger rather than the message and that's kind of a 
a cowardly way to do things. Um, and you only do that when you don't have truth on your side. Because if you have truth on your side, what you're going to do is you're going to attack the message and you're going to use truth to do that. But if you don't have truth, you can't do that. You have to just attack the person. Or if you're going to attack the message, you're going to misrepresent it so that you're not actually attacking the message, but you make it look like you are. Right. So those are the two types of things, ad hominem and um, straw man. Those are the two main ways in which people attack truth. So um, when we look then at this line, so we got Jotham's line and, and we can definitely put dates in there. We're going to put the major camp meetings um, that I'm connected with or when I'm delivering a message. So. Um, you know, 2014, it's going to be, um, you know, that camp meeting in the fall, in October um, 2015. This is actually going to be um, not because I'm not there in Arkansas presenting, but the camp meeting in the fall in Arkansas, I'm going to be opposed, even though I'm not there. It's going to be my paper that's opposed on the 2520 2016 Um this is going to be um, uh, when I'm at the School of the Prophets for three months, but it's going to be what happens at the beginning of that year that's going to be the opposition. That's where Tabo um, has a meeting with Jeff and myself and Kelly Ross, and, and Tabo's pretty upset about uh, things there. But Jeff then instead invites me to the School of the Prophets that how he, he addresses it. But we also know that Tabo, Parminder, and Marco are ordained as elders that year. 2017, that's going to be September 23rd, 2017, um, then October 13th, 2018, and then November 9th, 2019. So those would be the dates if we wrote them in, which I will at some point when I redo these diagrams. And then we have a Bimlex downfall so this is going to start on november 9th with this so we'll just do it over here so we're going to have that november 9th uh presentation on the 273 so there's two presentations i'm just going to put this here even though these are weak apart So we're just going to put 273 there. Now we, we need to mark these other dates. So we're going to, we're going to put July uh, 18th as this fourth way mark, because that's going to mark the end of FFA. So FFA is going to be, um, I'm going to put these down here, July 18th, 2020. So, so what are we going to mark as the formalization of this message of the 273? So this is when it's introduced. So this is the arrival of the message, even though I understood it earlier in October, we're gonna put it there. And then we're gonna have um, this message formalized. So what, what is a formalization? A clear understanding of what the, what the message is presenting. Okay. Now, there's different ways we could look at this, but I'm going to... I'm going to do it this way, and then you can tell me what you think about it. Now, I know not everybody knows all the dates of this history, but I'm going to present to Jeff. I'm going to send an email on April 26th. Now, it's not intentional that I send this email on April 26th. It just happened to be that way. On April 26th, I'm going to send an email and tell Jeff that I, I noticed that this July 18, 2020 prediction is on a line of failed predictions. 
starting with the December 21st, 2012 failed prediction. I'm going to have the September 23rd, 2017 failed prediction there as well. And, and I'm also, because that's 777 days before November 9th. And then I'm going to also have November 9th is a failed prediction. So what reason would we have to believe that July 18th is not also not a failed prediction? So, of course, the date that I send that April 26th is the 26th day of the fourth month. That's 264, right? So just it was an accident. Definitely not on purpose that I... I sent the email on that date. So I believe that that message then is formalized. It's put into a formal, based on the mind calendar that's presented here, the mind calendar now presents that this is going to be a failed prediction. Now, when we deal with um, this, I present uh, July 10th. So <clears throat> now July 10th, why would I put this as the empowerment? I mean, nothing happens on that date. So maybe this isn't a good date to put there. What was the date that the the warning was published? Okay, that's going to be July 20, uh, 21st. Not July 21st, June 21st. Okay, um, so maybe... Why, why wouldn't that be the empowerment? Okay, so I'm just letting you think how, I, how I'm looking at this. So I'm looking at what I presented on November 9th. What I did present July 18th as the center date between two dates. Right? So I'll, I'll show you this diagram. I can find it quickly. So I found that pretty quick. So what you're looking at here is this this. Uh, 273 days. And you can see it here clearly on the bottom one. So these dates were produced October 11th, 2019. I'm going to just, oops. This was produ produced by the Mayan calendar um, doing a calculation, which I'm not going to go into. <clears throat> and, and then the second date was uh, this April 9th, which is March 27th, 2021. And so, so I have these two dates and the center date there is July 10th, 2020. There's 273 days on either side of that date. So that's the date that was produced. So if you look at this here um, on October 11th, I, well, on October 10th, I get this date, October 11th, and this date, April 9th, with the July 10th date as the center. And then I'm going to present that um, 29 days later, yeah, 29 days later at um, uh, the School of the Prophets in Arkansas, November 9th, 2019. And that's going to be... Um, you know, the 252 days before July 18th, right? So there's this eight days or whatever in there, July 10th to 18th is eight days. <clears throat> so nothing happens on this date, but I see it as uh, this is like this confirmation of this structure because I get this July 10th date. So maybe that my thinking isn't the best on how I'm looking at this empowerment, but it's just a date that's produced that I present on November 9th, right? But we're going to have that other date, the April 26th date, in which I present sort of the conclusions that come from the Mayan calendar. So, so that's my thinking there. But I understand your thinking. Now, 
Now, part of it is we already have those dates in the other lines. So that was the other thing is, you know, I could have put, for instance, March 27th, 2020, and I could have put July 4th, 2020, uh, July 4th, 2020, because that's going to be the span of the 100 days, right? The 100 days of prayer. So I could have put March 27th and say, you know, that was a vindication of it. And, and maybe that's the best way to look at it. But those aren't dates particularly connected to the Mayan calendar, right? So maybe my thinking here is that this is about the Mayan calendar. And, and so, because, you know, this Jotham's line is going to start with the Mayan calendar date. In, and it's going to go to the November 15th, 2019 date, right? So that's going to be the 252 days. And then I present on November 9th, you know, seven days prior, if inclusive, uh, to that November 15th date. This idea of the Mayan calendar and how it relates to our lines. And so that's why I chose those dates. Um Because there's nothing with the Mayan calendar that relates to the J June 22nd date. So these are just dates that are representative of, of formalization and to me an empowerment. So the July 10th date is going to be, um, you know, eight days before July 18th. Technically, it's the Friday, right? Um, And any thoughts on that, Dwight, or anyone else? That I'd put in an empowerment date that has no event? I'd have to think that through. Okay. <clears throat> now, I, I think there was a little bit more to the July 18th date, that, or, or July 10th date. I just want to... I want to see what other charts. So there's how I got it. That's the Mayan calendar. This is what I presented on November 9th, 2019 in Arkansas. And you get the October 11th date and the April 9th date. And the April 9th date is March 27th, Julian, right? So it has that March 27th symbolism. Um, but it's the July uh, 10th date in between these two dates that I'm marking as the empowerment here. So there's J July 10th, date 2020. Um, and there I have again, a 273. And, and this was the other thing is that from the July 4th date to July 10th, 10th is um, seven cardinal days. Uh, we know, though, that the 100 days of prayer ended at the end of July 4th, right? So and then we had this May 15th date. I'm not going to go into all these different dates here. Um, but this July 10th ends up being sort of a center of a chiasm of July 4th to July 18th. So this is really six cardinal days and eight cardinal days. <clears throat> But together, I make it 14 days. So it depends how I'm counting it. Okay. And then um, this is a, what was this one? So this was um, not sure why 18th day of the fourth month. It's probably something, this is probably a working copy of something. Um, oh, this was the other one. So with the June 27th date, which is three weeks prior to July 18th, um, it's 21 days. July 10th is 13 days after June 27th, which symbolizes 18720 minutes and and then we have the eight days and the eight days of course is a symbol as well and then 13 days again to july 13th again a symbol of july 18 2020 so this was another part of this 273 
the 273 days going to March 27th and the 273 to December 25th. So this is a different structure of 273s and then 144 weeks from November 9th to August 13th, 2022. This was <coughs> part of a study dealing with um, uh, uh, Dan Vanderhorst, Daniel Vanderhorst. So <coughs> I had this in, in a number of different charts is all I'm trying to show. Um, and we did put it in the line of the judges, July 10th and 11th, 2020, dealing with judges 7, 10 to 11. So our time is up for today. But um, I just have one question. Um, Are we happy with how we're progressing through this study of judges? Do we think this is, is all the things that we've been studying the last few weeks, have they been profitable? Are we moving too slowly? No. I think we're moving at the right pace. Okay. Yeah, I know it's it's hard for people to to sort of follow these. Not everybody's watching all the videos. But... But I think we should be able to see from what was presented today that this that this is giving us information that we need. You know, maybe it's not so important exactly how we lay out these dates in a Bimelex downfall. I agree. It's giving us good information. It's what? It's good information, you it's said? It's good information, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for these studies and thank you for each person who has participated and those that watch. May your angels be watching over them. May your Holy Spirit continue to speak to them and through them. And may we come together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.